Are we panicked or are we patient with where the Chicago Cubs are at right now in the offseason? Let's go. You are Locked On Cubs, your daily Chicago Cubs podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Cubs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Sam Olber. Please support the show by following on your preferred audio platform, and you could watch, subscribe, and leave a comment on YouTube. Thanks so much for making us your first listen. We are lifelong fans taking our passion into a discussion with you on all things Cubs. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. It is a little bit of a somber episode because it's about 5 o'clock Central Time on Sunday. Two hours ago, the Chicago Bears blew their season and choked things away, similar to how the September month went for our Chicago Cubs. And, uh, you know, just getting a little tired of that routine and, you know, starting to starting to think about, you know, new hobbies, maybe some new friends and just doing things that don't make me disappointed, like watching sports stuff. Before I get into what what might be a little bit of an overexcited episode in a negative way, I want to give a shout out to one of our top everydayers, Carson. You've seen him on the show. He's uh, about 11 years old, going on 20 years old. Him and his family, he always sends me um, like blogs on e- his, his email to keep me posted on what he's doing. And he's on a family vacation right now, and they just hit Sloan Park uh, in Arizona, Mesa, Arizona, where the Cubs play sp- spring training ball. Carson, enjoy yourself. And you know, I don't know if you have any money stored away in your piggy bank, but you might want to leave it for Mr. Ricketts or Mr. Hoyer because we need to do something. Uh, and, and, and with that being said, let's get into the episode. And I think it's time. I think it's time to have that conversation of, you know, are we panicked or are we still patient as a fan base? And I'm going to kind of lay out both sides because I think – in any sort of argument like this, both sides make sense. And then I'll tell you where I'm leaning. The patient approach is the same approach that that we've had with Jed Hoyer. And I am probably at the top of the list in terms of Jed Hoyer supporters. I even did a show about a month ago, you know, and I think the title was the show of the show was in Jed Hoyer I trust. So I'm not fully going back on that, but the 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 case for being patient is this. The Cubs went for Shohei Otani. They missed. And as hard as it is to stomach, especially for ourselves who did maybe six shows on it, he didn't even really consider coming here. We thought he, we were in his top two. We really weren't. I don't think anybody was in his top two. He was going to the Dodgers the whole time. Uh, we wasted time on it, for sure. He wasted our time on it. They probably weren't ever realistically going to trade for Juan Soto. And that brings me to the other part of the patience uh, uh, case. Because the Cubs really aren't in a super, super win now mode. And trust me, I'll get to this in a second. But it's just the prospects haven't had enough chance to grow, blossom, and develop. Where Jed, I just think, feels really comfortable trading away some top, top guys. And obviously, to get Juan Soto, you would have had to do that. And I just don't think we're at that stage. And so I think not making a huge blockbuster trade isn't really the end of the world. I, I do know, and, I, and I, I did confirm this weekend, that the Cubs and Guardians are talking about Shane Bieber and Josh Naylor. But right now, the asking price is just too high for Jed. I, I, I don't think he feels comfortable. Forget Horton and PCA. I don't know if he feels comfortable giving up a Matt Shaw or Kevin Elcontra at this point. I don't know if I blame him unless it's a, a slam dunk. And so... Why haven't the Cubs spent in free agency yet? Well, outside of Otani, none of the app, n- none of the main names have have really gone off the board. Yamamoto will feels like any day now, uh, but he's just waiting out the market and, and waiting out his his best case, his p- best possible deal. He doesn't want to overpay guys. He doesn't want to get backed into a corner uh, with bad contracts. And and really, who have the Cubs absolutely lost out on that you really wanted? with Jed being patient besides Otani. 
And the last part of, of the case to be patient is, is the Cubs still currently sit ninth right now in payroll. And that's without them making any sort of uh, investment. I, I spent more money uh, on my secret Santa gift on Saturday at a holiday party than Jed Hoyer has spent on major league talent this off season. Uh, I, I guess technically not if you count the, uh, the reliever from Japan, uh, but still, you know what I mean? I, I, I forgot that guy's name already. So that tells you, you know, with all due respect to him, um, that type of acquisition, hopefully is good. Who knows? I, I just think if the Cubs, let's say they do add Bellinger on a bigger deal and they do add, God, I'm running out of names at this point, uh, um, Hoskins, and they do add a, a pitcher, you know, they should be in the top six, seven in payroll, which is right around where they should be. You could argue they should be top three, but you know, the case for patience is still there. And I have really been on that train for a while. But I must admit, I'm starting to go the other way, and that's panic. And the reason why I'm starting to have some panic has nothing to do with Jed as a decision maker. It's the overall mindset of the organization that has me a little bit irked and a little bit panicked. And credit to everybody out there when I made that show in Jed I Trust, and and the, the number one refute or rebuttal point was, Hey, Jed's making good decisions, but he, he's he's treating this team like a small market. Like, let's just go out and get better. Small market mindset. Small market mindset. And I, I didn't really buy that. I just thought Jed was kind of biding his time and trying to figure out when the right time to strike was. But <clears throat> this sitting around and waiting for the market, even if it is, this is this is it, this is kind of hard to explain. But even if it is the right decision. It's still a little bit off to me. It's just like, are we really waiting for the market to get right for a guy like Brett Suter or or, or, or Brent Suter? Or are we just trying to, you know, are we waiting because we know he's going to be there later? It's just weird. Why not just go get Brent Suter? You're the Chicago bleeping Cubs. Go out and get Brent Suter. It's not that big of a deal. Like, go get it. What what's the weight with Reese Hoskins? Is it is it a third year? Is, this is somebody you absolutely know that you need as a stopgap next year. Find a way to get it done. You shouldn't need John Morosi on Saturday night to start the leverage policy and say, hey, the Mariners are really in on Reese Hoskins. We all know Boris and the Cubs. They've been talking about Hoskins for months at this point. What's the holdup? Is it really worth the extra 20 cents on the dollar that you might spend for him? Just get it done so you can move forward. I, I just I'm confused at why I understand why you have to wait out Bellinger. I understand why you have to wait out the pitching market, but these little margin moves like a, like a suitor or another reliever or a second pitcher, Michael Waka two for 32 on Friday, uh, Jack Flaherty one for 14. If those guys were our second starting pitching acquisition in terms of talent. So we went out and got one of the big guys and one of the, then those guys, I'd be fine with that. Why weren't we in on those guys? What, what are we waiting for? If the answer is Jed's got something really big planned, he really is talking to the Guardians, and, and like I said, that, that was confirmed to me this weekend, that, that they are in talk. So if that's the case, okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. But if it's just Jed holding out and waiting for prices to come down, it feels, I, I don't know the right word, a little icky, a little off. We're, we're the Chicago Cubs. We should, the, the, the Mount Rushmore, of teams that are just the biggest team names, the biggest franchises that people want to see in the sport are the Yanks, Dodgers, Cubs, Red Sox. I just don't think that's debatable. Maybe the Phillies are creeping in there, maybe the Braves, but to me, it's been that big four. And that's not that's not as much about championships. It's just about notoriety and and presence and history. And I just don't like the idea. I'm starting to understand what people have said to me about that small market mindset about just sitting around waiting for the market. Just Pounce and do something. And I know that sounds kind of meathead and trolly of me. I'm not asking you to go give Cody Bellinger 270. But why can't we go get a reliever? And and the irony of this is, is Jed's being criticized for being a, a small market president of baseball operations. And a small market team like the Diamondbacks have actually gone out and done a great job. On Sunday, they re-signed Gurriel for a very affordable 42 M's on, on three years. Then... 
early in the year, they pounced on Eduardo Rodriguez for four years, 80 million, which is a little bit more than I thought he'd get. And that's probably what they had to do to scoop him up that early. They traded for a Eugenio Suarez. You tell me right now at home or on the road or wherever you're listening, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be a lot happier right now if the Cubs had already traded for a third baseman and, uh, Signed Eduardo Rodriguez for four years, 80. I wouldn't be having this podcast right now. I'd feel much more relaxed. And that's a small market team. So I guess what I'm trying to say is Jed isn't even doing small market things right now. He's just laying in the weeds. And the hope is that maybe tomorrow, the next week, by the time our live shows hit, January 10th and February 7th, at the St. Charles and Des Plaines Theaters, respectively, I could come out and say, hey, it worked out. And the path is to still have, there is a path to still have a very solid off season for the Cubs. They could go out and still get Bellinger at an affordable price. They can go get Montgomery or trade for Shane Bieber or maybe do both and then land Reese Hoskins. And they're in a better spot going into 24 than they were at the end of that year. It's still there. I'm just a little confused at what the holdup is. And, you know, there's a lot of talk on the radio uh, this weekend and Friday. Hey, you know, Cubs just haven't found a dance partner yet. There takes two to tango. Certain guys are asking for more. Well, maybe are, are you being too stingy? Are you trying to be too shrewd? I, I don't know. You know, what would you rather have as a fan? A, a bad deal, you know, maybe adding an extra year to Reese Hoskins or not having him at all. I don't know. You know, the Texas Rangers signed Jacob DeGrom this past offseason. He barely pitched for him. They won a World Series. When you're a big market organization and you you have great player development and you have a great farm system and you have financial resources, you should be able to absorb a bad contract. The Jason Hayward deal was a bad contract. Cubs still won a World Series in 2016. He gave him nothing, nothing his first year of that contract. He had like 218. You know, you can't be afraid to make bad deals when you're the president of the baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs. And I am still a Jed Hoyer supporter. I am not out. But for the first time, really, since the rebuild, I, I am a little bit closer to panic because I, I'm just confused at what our plan is. I, I feel great that we offered Shohei. That shows that we're willing to spend. But was that more of a business move or a baseball move? You know, I, I would feel a lot better on Tuesday for Tuesday's show if we went out and signed Brent Suter for two years, $15 million, or even if we just wrapped up the Hoskins. I just want to know that we're trying to do something and, you know, we execute it. Hopefully the Cubs can't figure out a deal for the, with, with the Guardians without having to give up one of their four or five names. I don't know. I just, as a fan, as a podcaster, I'm not all the way panicked. I still think the Cubs are going to be fine in 2024, <clears throat> and none of this really changes the big picture. The Cubs are in good shape, big picture-wise, because of their farm system. But for the first time, I'm starting to see what people mean about the mid-market, small-market mindset, and I want to see the Cubs go do something. Okay, They're not the Tampa Bay Rays. They're not the Oakland Athletics. They're not the Washington Nationals. They don't have to sit around and wait and say, hey, maybe maybe, maybe Suter can come down to $12 million if we just wait. Just Go get some things done and make some moves. So I'm very curious to hear what you guys think about that. You know, are you guys in panic mode? Are you still in patient mode? Are you like me where you're kind of in the middle, but you're starting to really see that panic pathway and, and you're starting to, to turn the car on and get ready to drive down there? Let me know in the comments, like the like the video if you're if you're watching on YouTube and let me know panic or patience. And you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I I just think that it, it was so frustrating for me this weekend. I, I was out and, and people were asking me about the Cubs. And it's like, I don't know the answer either. Like, I really don't know what Jed's doing. My guess is, is that he has some things in the works and he's waiting out the market. And the waiting out the market part's just a little annoying when it comes to lower level signings like Reese Hoskins and, and <clears throat> like I've said, Suter. But I really don't know for a fact, you know. Last year, Jed went out and he overpaid Jamison Tyone. Four years, $68 million, that was a, and, and you know, I talked to some sources on that. That was an industry eyebrow raiser. Like, whoa, the Cubs really, they kind of, they really needed a starter, and they went out and got Tyone. Like, in the past, even though Jed hasn't, you know, handed out a, a $200 million deal, he he's seen guys, identified them, and he went and got them. He went and got Swanson. $68 million. Mancini, two years, 14. The Cubs have to eat that $7 million this year. He's not on the team. I don't understand where the lack of aggression is coming from right now. And, you know, I want to give out a shout out to Ty. 
who has his podcast uh, that I did. Uh, um, and, you know, he's he's been on the show before and, and, and he came back at me after the council uh, hiring. And he made a great point that I just didn't think was true. And I'm starting to see it. And that was, are you at all concerned that they hired council because it's going to allow them to cut corners financially because council's so good on the uh, margins? I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say that exactly. And now you have to start to wonder that is, is council now like a crutch for Jed where it's like, Hey, Craig, I don't have a, I, I don't have a great organization. Or I don't have a great roster right now, but you know, you can make the best of it. Whereas with Ross, he had a really good uh, roster and a good, you know, path to win 90 games and he couldn't get it done. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm asking all these questions out loud because I'm a little bit nervous. Why didn't the Cubs go after Michael Waka as their second guy? Are, are we going to go into a year with Justin Steele, Kyle Hendricks, Jamison Tyone, Javier Assad, and Jordan Wicks as our starting five? Does that sound competitive to you? I know, I know Assad had a really strong ending to the year and Wicks showed flashes, but if those are your top five, that's not good enough. Suzuki, Hap, Swanson, Horner, Gomes, Morell, Mastro slash Madrigal, and Mervis. Is that good enough? No. There is a world, especially when you're a big market team, where you can build for the future and be patient with prospects and still put out a very solid team. They did that last year. They need to find a way to do it again, and they need to do it soon for my and our mental psyche. Coming up next, we're going to take a look around the MLB. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL season is coming to a close soon. And for our beloved Chicago Bears, it came to a close Sunday afternoon. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the Locked On Podcast Network and the National Football League. We are back here on Locked on Cubs. <sighs> Still kind of just marinating and digesting the September of the Cubs, the Bears lost to the Browns and Broncos and Lions. and Oh, man. You just love sports, you know? It just is what it is. Baseball weekend news. Things that impact the Cubs. few things. Number one, Yamamoto. Uh, met with Steve Cohen. I believe it was their second meeting. It was reported they had a dinner together Saturday night. Uh, that that does have some significance for the Cubs because if Yamamoto does end up a Mets, bad news because that means the Dodgers and Yankees become more desperate. There's basically two major, or I guess there's three major free agent pitchers left: Montgomery, Snell, and Imanaga. Cubs have not really been connected to Snell at all. Very limited connection on Montgomery and very connected to Imanaga. And you just have to imagine that if the two biggest, you know, paychecks, the biggest wallets, the Yankees and the Dodgers strike out on Yamamoto, they're probably going to strike with Imanaga, Montgomery or Snell. If the Mets strike out on Yamamoto, they might just say, you know what, forget it. Um, we're not going to, uh, you know, really, really go for it this year. So who knows? Uh, I already talked about Guriel re-signing with the Diamondbacks. That's somewhat good news for the Cubs because I think he's a pretty good player. And at three years, forty-two million, that should bring the market down a little bit. Like I, I I'm not sure. You know, th there's certain guys on on the block that I don't think are better than Guriel. Th so, so they shouldn't be asking for that much more money than Guriel. Like I, I don't think you know a conversation with JD Martinez or Soler should really be that complicated. It should be a pretty easy target of what they're looking for. You know, Martinez and Soler are better hitters than Gurriel, but Gurriel plays a really solid defense. He was worth three wins above replacement last year. Like he was a good player. That's a very affordable deal. Like with all due respect to Ian Happ, you know, look, I look at Gurriel and I look at Ian Happ as very similar players and, and Ian Happ's making 20 million a year, three years, 61 and Gurriel got three years, 42. So I think Ian Happ's probably pretty excited about uh, his extent, extension that he signed because it seems like he got a little bit more than he probably should have. And, um, 
you know, hopefully this will will get Jed to be able to spend some money and these prices will come down on guys. Uh, last thing I just want to close with is, you know, Jeff Passan on Thursday, I believe, was on uh, Waddle and Sylvie. Matt and I touched on it. One thing I, I, I think to take away from Passan's uh, interview was that he really, you know, I, I don't want to put him, say he, he said anything or confirmed or denied, but when Pete Alonzo was brought up, there was a pretty palpable that very well might happen between he, he and the Cubs. I don't think it's going to happen this year in the off season, but you know, I would really monitor the Pete Alonzo and Mets situation because if they don't agree to an extension before this off season, which there isn't much indications that, that they're going to, I, I think, you know, him to the Cubs is, is very likely and probably why Hoyer is, is having a hard time with the Hoskins negotiation because he doesn't want to go to a second year with Hoskins or a third year, whatever it is, because he probably feels like Pete Alonso is going to be his first baseman potentially in 2025. So, you know, that might be a reason for it. If, if Reese Hoskins is asking for like a three or $60 million deal coming off a torn ACL, then just pivot, sign Brandon belt, and go belt wisdom at first base and then wait for Alonzo to come. Cause it's just, that's trivial. You know, that's trivial. He, the, the Cubs are going to give him an opportunity to re-raise his value, you know, sign, do, do the Bellinger deal one year, 16, one year, 17, come here, ball out and you'll get all the money you want work for Bellinger. It'll probably work for you. So that's pretty much all I got for today's show. I just kind of wanted to you know, express my concern, but, but hopefully you guys are in a better place. Maybe you could talk me off the ledge a little bit. Maybe this will be the week the Cubs make a move that isn't Jorge Alfaro. And, you know, we, we, we continue in this off season. Patience is a virtue. I absolutely believe that. I've always believed that good things come to those who wait, but you know, you, you just, as a fan, you look up, it's, it's almost Christmas time a year ago today. A year ago today, Argentina won the World Cup, which was the second greatest sports moment of my life, obviously um, behind November 2nd, 2016. The Cubs had Dansby Swanson. The Cubs had Cody Bellinger. The Cubs had Jamison Tyone. The Cubs had re-signed Drew Smiley. There was a lot that had already happened, and, you know, you, you want things to happen. I don't think there's a world where the Cubs don't make any additions. Um, but but it is a little bit scary that here we are on December 18th where I really can't tell you if the Cubs are going to be a really solid team next year or if they're not going to be very good. I have no idea. It's the same thing I always talk about with Justin Fields. I think he might be great. I think he might not be very good. I don't know. And the fact that I don't know this late on in his tenure is a problem. Same with the, with the Cubs. The fact that we might approach Christmas and I can't tell people – Hey, I think we're going to win about 88, going to be really good. Or, hey, this could be like a 76-win team here. I'm not really sure. That startles me a bit. Does it startle you? Comment below. We will see you guys on Tuesday. Matt and I are going to do a full slate of shows this week, and then it'll, it'll taper off around the holidays to about three days a week. Shout out to the everydayers who are with us all five episodes throughout the week, and you can become an everydayer by checking us out each and every weekday. Be sure to hit that subscribe button for Locked On Cubs on YouTube and smash the like button for the algorithm, please. We are also on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts and streaming on Sirius XM. I'm Sam Olber, and this was a very emotional episode of Locked On Cubs. <laughs>